my name is Val. I'm so glad you're joining us online today. You know, no matter where you are right now, this online campus is here to provide you with a church family. That means we don't want you to just watch a service. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to help be a drop of hope in your life. But the only way we can do that is if you let us know you're here. The way you can let us know you're watching us is by filling out the Connect card or by dropping us an email at online at visitoasis.org. Now, if you live in the South Florida area, I want to encourage you to visit our local campus here in Pembroke Pines, Florida. For more information about our location and times, you can go on our website, www.visitoasis.org, and click on the time and location button. But stick through the end of the service because we got some more information about how you can get connected and how we'd like to help serve you and help you continue this journey with God. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's message. God bless you. And I just want to tell you, I, I feel like my family and I were honorary members now of, of Oasis Church, if you'll have us. I just absolutely love this thriving congregation. What the Holy Spirit is doing in and through this church is just marvelous. And friends, I, I feel I do have an informed opinion. One aspect of our ministry is traveling the country. We do events like these in churches um, of all denominations. And can I just say you all are so blessed with your shepherd, Pastor Guy, and this amazing team that you have here at Oasis Church. And I think we need to give them a big round of applause and thank God for the leadership. It's amazing to have faithful leaders, isn't it? It's a blessing to have shepherds who lead us in our walk with Jesus Christ, and you all are so blessed to have such phenomenal leadership. And Pastor Guy is exactly right. When Pastor Ricky emailed me uh, in January and said, we, we want to do a series on doubt, of course, I think it's tremendous that the church is discussing this. You don't want to miss any of these four-week uh, four-week topics that you have in the series. This is week two. Uh, but I did reach out and I said, well, would you all like to be the first church to have my new book, Answers to Tough Questions? And they said, absolutely. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're eight or 18 or 80 years of age, we all have unanswered questions. And as I said last time I was here, Jesus liked questions a lot. He asked over 300 of them in the Gospels, 322 questions uh, to be exact. So if you did my previous book or Bible study unanswered, this is the natural follow-up. It's six more questions, and I want to read them to you because, like I said, we all have these questions. Is there a God? Is Jesus God? Do we even need to defend our faith? Does absolute truth really exist? Aren't all religions the same? I mean, aren't we all just worshiping the same God? And then I think my favorite aspect was also what proof does my testimony offer? And you know what, friends? I believe that when we study unanswered questions, it should actually be rooted in a Bible study. Because after all, when we have unanswered questions, we need to go to God's word, not Google. And all God's people said, amen. amen. And so that's why rather than just producing a book, I wanted to produce a Bible study to answer these questions. It does come with a DVD. And then it's so fun. We've added these download codes so you can literally pop them right in your cell phone. We have a limited quantity of these that I got Lifeway to ship here for this weekend. And I would love to sign those to you uh, or to anyone that you have in your life with unanswered questions questions. Some of you are going to want to get more than one. And as pastor said, you can do it individually. You can do it as a group. It's a great resource. And I had so much fun crafting and putting the material together. It's, it's the latest and greatest too in biblical scholarship and evidence. On the videos, this is quite fun. Um, I filmed in the Tennessee State Capitol in a beautiful library that actually predates the Civil War. So it's a lot of eye candy too when you're watching, uh, when you film, there's 25 minute lessons in there. So, and then it's, it's, it was just a blessing to get that done. So friends, I'm thrilled to be back for this series on doubt. My Bible text this morning is John chapter 18, and I would invite you to turn uh, in the copy of, of God's word that you have or flip there on your phone. And we've included the sermon outline notes that I want you to take careful notes of today's message. I'm answering a very important question that relates to doubt. Doubt is prevalent in our society and much more so today than at any other time I've seen in our ministry. And there's a lot of reasons for doubt being so prevalent. And I want to just say this right at the beginning, doubt is not a bad thing. Doubt is not a sin. 
some of the finest Christian leaders, some of the finest examples that we have in the scriptures were men and women who went through periods of doubt. I was speaking last night about John the Baptist. Can you imagine John the Baptist who, when Jesus saw John the Baptist, he said, no one greater has been, more, has been born among men. And yet it was later in Luke's gospel that John the Baptist wrote in Luke, Luke 7 to 19, they quote him going to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples saying, is it you or do we seek another? And how did Jesus respond to John the Baptist's doubt? Did he rebuke him? Did he tell him, you know, you're a second rate Christian? No, he responded with evidence and with answers. And what did he say in Luke 22? And this was key for the Messiah. He said, go back. And where was John the Baptist, by the way, when he was doubting? We know this from Josephus. He was in the prison of Machairus. Antipas would execute him, Herod Antipas, very quickly. And Jesus responds in verse 22, tell John the Baptist, the blind see, the deaf hear. And he said in Greek, the dead are necros agairo, the dead stand up. He responded with evidence. He didn't rebuke him. So, hey, if you're doubting here today, you're in good company because John the Baptist doubted, and he was the forerunner of the Messiah. And so this morning, I want to give answers and evidence in the same spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. And one of the main reasons that people doubt so much today is because we have lost sight of absolute truth. By the way, um, I want to very briefly say hello to you from my family because I do consider us to be honor honorary members of Oasis Church. Uh, this is my return back. I want to show you a picture, an updated picture of the family. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm the overstressed father of triplets. I haven't slept in three years except for the hotel room last night, which was a blessing. Lily Faith is 10, Justin is 7, and friends, I am here. I, I, I married a superhero and I could not travel and uh, do what I do across the country without an amazing wife. So I hope that you'll keep my family in prayer and our ministry, Christian Thinker Society, in prayer. We need your prayers. I'm on the front lines as a defender of the faith. Um, so many other things I want to share with you, and I hope to meet as many of you as I can in the cafe. Since I was here last, we launched a nationally syndicated radio program. So if you like what you're hearing today, I do this every week, and there's a podcast called The Jeremiah Johnston Show. You can download it right now on your phone, and there's 60 programs, 60 hours of content of doing nothing but dealing with people's doubts, answering unanswered questions. People go to askjjj.com, they submit their questions, and that's how I decide what we do our shows on, those subjects. And I really think we need to get beyond the soundbite culture, beyond bumper sticker theology. So I really enjoy dedicating an entire hour to some of these very difficult questions because great questions deserve a great response. Um, we just celebrated a few weeks ago the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And living in Houston where NASA is based, it was a massive celebration. And I want to take you back to that moment. And those of you who were alive 50 years ago, you probably remember exactly where you were when man first stepped on the moon. And it was in those 13 minutes on July 20, 1969, when Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong are descending towards the moon, and you see behind me Mission Control. You can actually go in Mission Control if you visit the Johnson Space Center outside of Houston near League City, Texas. Imagine this. They were descending at a, at a rate of 125 feet per second in the lunar landing module, and they are receiving CAPCOM communication from 238,000 miles away that's going in and out right back there in Houston. And you can go now and you can actually listen to the conversation that's happening. And it truly was a worldwide celebration because 400,000 engineers, scientists, mathematicians, professors, and factory workers took place in this momentous occasion that would have cost, in today's currency, ready for this, $200 billion if it was today's currency to put people on the moon. So it was a global affair. Everyone knows where they were. And you can go back and you can actually listen. They say it was the only time they, they saw Neil Armstrong flinch was when he saw a reading on the computer they had not seen before, and they were absolutely reliant on the computer. He goes, 1202, we need a reading. 1202, we need a reading. And you hear the conversation coming from the mission controllers. By the way, do you want to know what the average age of the mission controllers was on July 20, 1969? 
26 years of age. They were so young, they were interviewed for the anniversary. They said, we were so young, we didn't know we needed to be afraid. Every single thing had to go right for the mission to be a success. Stop right there for a moment. I want to draw an analogy. What if those average age 26-year-old mission commanders radioed back to Neil and Buzz and said, hey, Neil and Buzz, you know, we're enjoying our Cuban coffee. We're going to just cross our legs here, sit back in our chairs, and, you know, you just perform the moon landing according to your truth. You land however you feel, see fit. If you want to turn off the engines, if you want to reduce your carbon footprint, whatever you want to do, just land however you see fit. According to your truth, what would the result have been, ladies and gentlemen? It would have been an absolute disaster. There was only one absolute truth to put those men on the moon. The laws of physics and the laws of science and mathematics show us there was one right way in many wrong ways. It was absolute truth. And yet, if you listen closely, if we apply the clever cultural commentary that exists today, and this is one of the reasons doubt is so prevalent in our lives, culture tries to tell you, are you ready for this? The truth is, there is no absolute truth. And this is such a clever argument against our faith. Have you ever met someone, you probably have had a conversation with someone, a worker, a friend, a family member who says, that's so great for you. I'm glad you've got the religion. That's your truth. That's not my truth. This is so prevalent even among, of course, in the media, on social media, people pound this. It is so popular at the highest levels. We're spending tens of thousands of dollars to go to secular universities where professors actually teach something called relativism. Truth is relative to your situation in life, to your time, to your circumstance, and you can have your truth and I can have my truth or you don't have to have any truth at all. I want to teach you in four specific ways how to respond to what I think is the most clever attack against Christians right now, and it's called relativism. I do want to say this as a, for a moment. If you know anything about my background, I've had the privilege, by God's grace, to study at the highest levels, to do my residency in Oxford, my doctorate. There are very sophisticated attacks on the Christian faith. I want you to know that. There are extremely sophisticated attacks. What I'm teaching you about this morning is not one of them. Even though there are sophisticated attacks, this though, this though, it, it is not a sophisticated attack, it is quite popular, and it has gained traction, especially among our young people. That, that, you know, truth is just whatever you want it to be. Truth is a moving target. So how do we respond to this? And friends, I want to make this very clear why this message, I believe, is so important. You are going to see how relativism, or saying absolute truth doesn't exist, it doesn't really work in real life. I mean, if when I got on United Airlines to fly here yesterday, I would have jumped for the exit if the airline pilot would have said, you know, I just feel like I'm going to land the plane according to my truth. I'm going to turn off the engines, uh, and I'm just going to, I'm going to fly however I see fit. I'm not going to get on the, I'm, I'm going to land late this evening in Houston, Lord willing. I'm going to get on the highway, I-10, 24 lanes of highway in Houston, Texas. I'm hoping people will believe in absolute truth and laws when I, as I drive home for an hour today. Do you see how this, no, really, it doesn't work in real life. You see how this is a game that culture plays with us. It really boils down to two things, relativism in your behavior or relativism in your ethics or your religious beliefs. And so that's really what it boils down to. If we could not determine truth, we would not live very long. And you might think, you know, Jeremiah, oh, that doesn't really apply to me. Do you know what's happening in China right now? I have a burden for China. I've been, I've ministered with the underground church in China. Do you know right now the People's Republic of China has released their sanctioned Bible. Because here's the deal. When you say absolute truth doesn't exist, it actually gives you an opportunity to insert new truth. And in the Communist Republic, People's Republic of China Bible, guess what? There are no Ten Commandments in their new sanctioned Bible because you cannot say you will have no gods before me if you're a good communist in the People's Republic of China. Jesus is completely edited in. 
We don't see any of the same teachings. And what, what are we seeing? They're taking the actual copy of God's word, the authentic copies, and they're burning them. Do you see how dangerous it can be when you are in societies that say absolute truth does not exist? And I'm going to show you, even though I don't think it's a sophisticated attack, we see the effects of relativism all over our world today. I'm going to share you, with you a story when I close my message, a very personal story. I've only shared it a couple of other places. I feel comfortable sharing it here today of how relativism even made an impact with our own family. But our world, friends, is very much in truth trouble. What is our job as careful Christian thinkers? And listen, it is up to every one of us as followers of Jesus to love God with our heart, soul, and mind, right? Right? Every one of us need to get beyond our Sunday school understanding of, of Scripture, and that's important, but we need to love God with our mind. That means we can answer our own unanswered questions. It means even if we're doubting, we don't stay there. We don't allow a question to paralyze us spiritually or intellectually or emotionally. We seek truth at all costs. That is what we're up against. I want to share with you a very important quote from Blaise Pascal. Pascal was a wonderful thinker in the 17th century. Unfortunately, he died when he was 39 years of age. Uh, he was a mathematician, a scientist. We would not be able to do meteorology like we do today without the work and the inventions of Pascal with the barometer. Pascal, though, said this, when it comes to truth and doubt, men despise religion they hate it, and they're afraid that it may be true. The cure for this is to first show that religion is not contrary to reason, but worthy of reverence and respect. Next, when we share the gospel, friends, this quote is worth the entire experience in worship today. When we share the gospel, we need to make it attractive, make men wish it were true, and then show them that it is. Stop right there. When you share your faith, do people, is their first reaction Oh, I wish that were true. Do you see the job that we have to give the good news of the message of the gospel is first to present our faith so effectively that first and foremost, men and women, our neighbors, our family, they wish it to be true. They want it to be true. That's your job, and that's what I pray is a payoff of you experiencing this four-week series on doubt here at Oasis Church, that you will leave here committed to present the gospel so effectively that people wish it were true. But as I say, many people don't realize that we're in truth trouble today. Um, friends, if you don't need to look any further than what's happening even in the public school systems today that, to know that truth is utterly under attack. Gallup has been asking Americans here in North America um, if they believe the Bible is absolute truth for 40 years, and it is at a 40-year low. Only 24% of Americans, according to a 2017 data point, say that they believe the Bible contains absolute truth. A 2016 data point says that two-thirds of Americans, adults, believe that moral truth is relative. And I think the reason is far too many followers of Jesus malfunction when they hear this argument against our faith. Well, that's just your truth. That's not my truth. And friends, I want to make it very clear because leaders define reality. There is a graduate level of skepticism that comes against our faith every day right now. Did you know that? I mean, it's at a graduate level, so you and I cannot have an unthinking freshman response. We have to be good disciples. We have to do what Jude 3 says, contend for the faith. Love God with our heart, soul, and mind. Be ready always, 1 Peter 3.15, to give a reason for the hope that's within us. And far too many Christians, they get the deer in the headlights look, you know, the tongue-tied look, paralyzed into silence. We shouldn't do that. Why? Because the scales of truth tip in our favor as followers in G of Jesus. So what can we do? First thing, I, I, I want to just make it very clear because we have new believers who are here today. Think about this for a moment. We have smart cars. We have smart homes. I'm wearing a smart watch. Ladies and gentlemen, we need smart Christians. And all God's people said, amen. I need you to be a smart Christian. I need you to be a thinking Christian 
because that's what the Word of God has called us to. How do we answer this question in four, in, how do we answer this in four ways? Number one, what is truth? John 18, verses 17, or excuse me, verses 37 and 38. We come midstream into our Bible text this morning, and you are going to see how powerful this is when we do what's called exegesis. We pull this verse apart, and you're going to see an impact you may not have seen. You may be familiar with this conversation, but you may never have quite studied it this way before. In verse 37, and let me give you his Latin name, Marcus Pontius Pilate, is having a conversation with Jesus of Nazareth. And keep in mind the context, because we always read the scripture in context. In Pilate's mind, he represents the Son of God, Emperor Tiberius. In Pilate's mind, he represents absolute truth, Emperor Tiberius. And so he looks at Jesus and he says, you're a king then, Pilate responds. Jesus replies, I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Verse 38, Pilate responds, what is truth? Now, friends, look at your copy of God's word with me. I want to encourage you to to circle the definite article. There's two definite articles in Jesus' response in John 18, 37. What's the definite article in our English language? It's the word the Jesus responds and he says to Pilate, and by the way, this is the clearest mission statement for the life and mission of Jesus that appears in the four Gospels, I have come to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And then Pilate responds, and you know what, Pilate's interesting, Um, he's indicative of that modern secularist. Hardened to that which would save his soul. He was neither interested or even had the slightest idea what truth was. And so notice there's no definite article. What is truth? Do you see the power of the word of God? We are talking about absolute eternal truth when we come to John chapter 18, verses 37 and 38. So what does the Bible teach us about truth? The truth the Bible teaches tells us, it's easy to define actually, truth corresponds with reality. You can see it all around us. Truth is, corresponds with reality at all times. It never changes. And listen, it exists whether you believe in it or not. Did you know that? I can sincerely believe, not believe in gravity and launch myself off of this platform. And even though I sincerely believe gravity does not exist... You, you know what's going to happen. Gravity exists whether I acknowledge it or not. It is absolute truth. There is no such thing as an all-inclusive truth. The Bible teaches truth, by definition, is exclusive. Something cannot be true for me and false for you. The Bible says truth is absolutely true for all people. Make sure you get this down at all times, in all places, or it's not truth at all, ladies and gentlemen. That is the standard of truth. But yet, culture is constantly trying to deceive us into believing that truth is somehow limited by your circumstance. You know, if something unplanned happened to you, you can switch your truth. Truth is limited by your different situation or your place in life or where you live. Truth is limited to your personal preference. That is false. And we have to stand against it. I think of what that great uh, professor of Wheaton, Arthur, Arthur Holmes, uh, he wrote a book, and you probably know the title of the book. You might have even used this title, even if you've never read it. He wrote this excellent book called All Truth is God's Truth, and it's a fantastic book, and let me give you the principle of his book. He sh- teaches, since all truth is God's truth, Since God is truth, we can have a firm belief that any truth we find in the world can and will be reconciled with our faith. All truth is God's truth. Number two, so are we talking about the truth or truth? Look again at John 18, 37 and 38. Jesus, I love this conversation with Pilate. He doesn't look at Pilate and say, you know, Pilate, I know the truth. Or Pilate, um, I have the truth, or I teach the truth. He looks at Pilate, and he says, I am truth embodied. 
Now, don't miss this for a moment. Don't miss the application. Truth, the truth, is standing right before Marcus Pontius Pilate, and he can't even see it, and it's right in front of him. Do you see how confused we can get? And friends, my heart goes out to you this morning if you're confused. The lies of the enemy can so confuse us that often we don't even see the truth. We don't see the answer, and the answer is standing right in front of us. And how do I spell truth, body of Christ? I spell truth, J-E-S-U-S. That is how we spell truth. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. Absolute truth is a relationship, and you come, to, you come into relationship. When you lock into that truth, it actually makes your life have total clarity. It takes all of the confusion and the complexity away. But it's amazing to me, when you study truth in the Gospel of John, this theme keeps popping up throughout. Remember, what is, I know you know John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the what, say it out loud, truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John 4, 24. When we worship God, we must worship him in spirit and in what? Say it out loud. Truth. John 1, 14 to 18. I love the prologue of John's gospel. In fact, it's the only place the word grace shows up in the entire gospel of John. It says of Jesus that he came in verse 14 from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. And here's the rest of the prologue of John's gospel. It actually tells us that you can go from strength to strength in John 1:14 to 18 when you lock into the truth. So I want to ask you, where are you at this morning? Are you living in strength to strength because you're locked in the truth? Or are you confused? Are you weak in your faith? Are you doubting? Perhaps it's because you have not locked into the truth. And I love the force of the Greek in John 1. Because remember, why am I picking out other scriptures? Scripture always corroborates scripture. We interpret scripture through the lens of other scripture. I'm bringing out a theme of truth that is embedded throughout the gospel of John. Do you see what John's gospel is trying to do here? He wants your life to go from strength to strength, grace upon grace, one blessing after another. You cannot do that if you're not locked into truth, ladies and gentlemen. And if you are not studying the word of God, if you are not faithfully attending church, if you are not taking advantage of the great resources that are available to you as a Christian, you're going to get stuck. And that's when the enemy attacks us in the quicksand of doubt. Number three, notice Jesus said absolute truth is from God. The source of truth is God Almighty. Jesus came, 114, from the Father, full of grace and truth. So everyone who is of the truth, ectes aletheus, listens to my voice. I want to show you Papyrus 52. Um, This is actually the earliest fragment of the New Testament. And let's go ahead and bring it on the screen if we can, gentlemen. This is Papyrus 52. These are high-resolution photographs that I have permission to show you from the keeper of the John Rylands Library at University of Manchester. I first studied this fragment 10 years ago when I lived in the United Kingdom. And you're actually looking at, it looks like a mirror, but you're looking at a page from the earth. By the way, this is the earliest New Testament fragment. Did you know that? And how do we know it's early? We date it through handwriting style called the science of paleography. So we know that this dates to AD 125, When is John's gospel written, Bible students? Around 80, 90s. Do you realize the fragment I'm showing you today was in circulation the exact same time the the actual autograph of John's gospel was in circulation? Why am I showing you P52? What does it say? If you go down to line six, which would be the verso, look at line six And then go over straight to the right from line six on the fragment on the right. It says in Greek, ek tes aletheus, of the truth. Do you know the very passage we're learning about this morning is remembered in the earliest New Testament fragment that we have right now in the John Rylands Library. This is the conversation that Jesus has with Pilate and he says, everyone who is ectes aletheus of the truth. Isn't that powerful? This stuff gets me exciting when we can actually study the Bible in the very conversation that we're studying, the earliest New Testament fragment, Papyrus 52, remembers this conversation. 
Fourthly, do not deny yourself the quest for truth. I pray that you will leave today and this series on doubt committed to pursue truth at all costs. And this is point four, gentlemen. Listen, because everything outside of truth is a lie. We have to be committed once we come to faith in Jesus Christ to pursue truth at all costs. Everything outside of truth is a lie. This is a great revealer for where people, men and women, where your heart is at today. Are you denying yourself the quest for truth? Are you allowing sin to cloud your, your knowledge of truth? Friends, it's a real revealer of people's heart. I think the most dangerous place that a person can get to is when they stop pursuing truth. When they th- believe that truth is somehow not relative to them. It is a very, very dangerous place to get. And friends, I want to just share this with you. Moral relativism, if you listen to the lies of culture that are based on the enemy, they'll flatly say that, you know, it's possible for you to live outside of truth, and you can be free. You can be free living outside of truth. No, guess what? That is a prison of your own design when you try to live outside of truth. Living outside of Jesus' truth confines you to this prison of sin. We will know the truth, and John 8 says... The truth will do what in our life? It will set us free. Have you been set free by truth? So whatever your doubt is this morning, lock into the truth. I want you to hear that from your speaker. I have found the freedom and the joy that comes from living in the truth. It's amazing how strong you can be when you can stand and say, I know I'm at the center of God's will for my life. That's a powerful place to stand in. It's a place of victory. It's a place of blessing. Doesn't mean there's not adversity. Oh, you better believe it. When Satan knows that you are in the center of God's will, he's coming after you, but greater is he who is in me than he who's in the world. By knowing the absolute truth in Christ and dwelling with him, don't forget this, I go from strength to strength. I don't go to confusion. And so in our final minutes, if you want to prove that absolute truth exists, the best way to prove that absolute truth exists is for me to give you some clear-cut examples of some of the most horrific evil imaginable. Um, Pastor Guy was kind enough to mention my book, Unimaginable, What Our World Would Be Like Without Christianity. And I wanted to answer, if you listen to the secularists, the professors, Bill Maher, the late-night talk show, most of secular media you're going to hear that, you know, Christians are holding back progress. If we can just get rid of religion, but especially Christians, the world would be a much better place. I want to give you the thesis of my book in two points. The church unified and mobilized, listen, ladies and gentlemen, is the greatest force for good on planet Earth. And I was, I kept sending examples to my publisher of how Christianity is changing the world today. And they finally said, Jeremiah, stop sending us examples. We have too many. You're overwhelming us that we can actually go beyond just saying, God bless you. And we can trace the impact that Christianity is making. And I can also show 12 ways your world would change tomorrow if there was no church, if there was no church. But number two is very important. I want you to know this. The gospel of Jesus Christ, when followed, will always bring me into conflict with society, culture, and contemporaries. You better believe it. As the church goes, so culture goes. And so, friends, I don't allow the secular media to train me. I allow the word of God to train my mind. So what would a society without God look like? What happens, and I've studied this, what happens in countries that embrace relative truth. You know, absolute truth doesn't exist. Well, number one, inequality. You can look historically or you can look, and guys, thank you so much, moral relativism, eugenics. It's scary when you study people like Nietzsche and the Enlightenment thinkers who are deified in our local universities, and I have a whole section on these thinkers. There are five thinkers that moved the world away from God. This is six things that will happen. You can count on it. You can take a picture of it. This is what will happen when we deny absolute truth. Humanity will be dehumanized. Um, It's amazing how they talk about the, the loss of the right to live so quickly. It was Nietzsche who said, you know, we need to cull the masses of humanity for the best specimen. And if a few million need to die, so be it. Genocide. 
Survival of the strong and the aggressive, that's what Peter Singer says. You know, we can no longer believe that you're a special creation alone. You know, you're just a two-legged animal. The law of the jungle applies. No purpose, no ultimate meaning. And so as I say on page 75 of my book, Unimaginable, I want, it's a slippery slope when Christianity is sidelined. And this is why you have to be equipped to answer this question. Let me give it to you in the Greek. In societies where God is marginalized and Christianity is pushed aside, it is much easier to kill people. It is much easier to enslave. It is much easier to marginalize. And so, friends, we see something different with Christianity. Of course, there was someone by the name of Adolf Hitler who, and I want to show you this picture of him because he, they, this was some of the propaganda, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, one leader, one people, one Lord. And then in 1937, Hitler begins to call on Christians to swear total allegiance to the Third Reich. Because when you deny absolute truth, you can insert your own truth. And for Hitler, that was my truth, his truth. And there were great men and women who stood against swearing total allegiance. And I want to introduce you to one of them, Ernst Kesemann, a, secu- a wonderful thinker, a preacher, a professor. And he knew, ladies and gentlemen, in 1937 that he had Gestapo in his church. And do you know what his Bible text was that morning? Because he believed and embraced absolute truth, Lord our God, other lords beside you have ruled over us, but your name alone do we honor. He was arrested and sent to a concentration camp. And friends, I want to ask you a question. Where are the Ernst Kasemans today? Where are the men and women today who will stand against injustice, stand against evil, believing in absolute truth? That's that's the... That is... That's our example, and there are many others that I could point to, but I do in our, in our final seconds, I want to share something very personal about how dangerous rel- relativism can be, and if you'll just flip to that final slide for me uh, with my boys on the back of the truck. Um, friends, uh, <laughs> we, we have triplets, and I thought that the sonogram uh, tech was singing Michael Jackson because he went A, B, C, one, two, three, when I found out that we were having triplets, and it was scary. My wife's body began physically shaking, and it's still a little scary, to be honest with you. Uh, And I have good news, by the way. We're no longer doing 700 diapers a month. We're doing 450 diapers a month. God bless you, and thank you all for buying a book. God bless you for that. It's very missional. Uh, (laughs) I want you to look at these boys, though, because Jackson on the left, and then Abel on the right, Ryder in the middle. Now, Ryder James... um, had our undivided attention in the pregnancy because it took us six weeks to get an appointment with the Johns Hopkins maternal fetal medicine doctor uh, at Texas Children's Hospital. And you, I don't know if you've ever been in that place when you're just waiting to have the appointment, how stressful that can be with a, with a specialist. We walk into the appointment, and within minutes of this appointment, we're told that it's likely that Ryder will develop TTTS, He will hoard all the nutrients from his brother Abel, killing Abel, endangering his life, and endangering Audrey's life. And in that first five minutes of the appointment, she gave us the option of a, quote, fetal reduction. Now, friends, I want to just say something for a moment. Talk about a cultural euphemism, a fetal reduction. And I I was overwhelmed. I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you're just kind of blindsided in in a meeting. But you know what's great about a biblical worldview? When you have a biblical worldview in your family, you don't need to huddle when you're confronted with evil, when you're confronted with relativism. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I didn't need to say a word. My spirit-filled, awesome wife, Audrey, spoke right up, and she said to that, that doctor who we have great respect for, she said, Doctor, we will trust the Lord. And you know what's amazing? None of those 86 things, honestly that were supposed to happen, happened. And Audrey became the textbook, to use Texas Children's Hospital's words, the textbook triplet pregnancy. She carried those boys to 33 weeks. They were in the NICU for two months, and they have come home, and they are as ornery and healthy as ever, ladies and gentlemen. But do you see how I use that as a very personal example? I don't know. It might not be a fetal reduction conversation in your mind. It may be something else with a spouse. 
It might be something at university. It might be something in your workplace. I want you to be ready for those conversations because when you have an, a biblical worldview, and this is why this series on doubt is so vitally important, you don't have to stop and huddle because you've already made the decision. You've locked into absolute truth. You don't need to wonder. You don't need to pray if you should stay in that relationship if it's not locked into the truth. You don't need to pray about if you need to stay in this place or have proximity with these issues if it's not about truth. So will you commit to pursue truth at all costs? I pray that you will. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study John 18, 37, and 38 this morning. We thank you for what you've taught us in your word, Lord God. And Father, we do as a church family in this series on doubt want to commit to pursue truth at all costs. And Lord, we confess that everything outside of truth is a lie. Now, Father, so many of us, we get stopped by lies. Every one of us do, Lord. And that's why we need your grace this morning. And so, Father, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give everyone in this room an opportunity to just simply confess if, if they've been stuck by a lie of the enemy. You know, you can just confess it right now to the Lord in your heart and say, Lord, you know, I got stopped by that lie from the enemy. Lord, forgive me for not pursuing truth at all costs. Forgive me, Lord, for when I've allowed lies of culture and relativism to confuse me. Will you take a moment? First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The first step out of doubt, the first step to locking into truth is to receiving Jesus as my Savior. And friends, I cannot forgive you of your sins, but I can lead you to Jesus Christ. The scripture says, he that believeth has been given everlasting life. And what do you need to believe? You need to trust in the fact that Jesus died for your sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried, and that three days later, he physically, bodily rose from the grave, conquering death, providing access to God eternally, forgiveness for you immediately. If that's you, you can pray this prayer and evidence your trust in Christ by just saying, Lord Jesus, right now by faith, I place my trust in you for my forgiveness, for my redemption, for eternal life in heaven. Help me to lock in to your absolute truth in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. I look forward to meeting you all after. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thanks for checking out this week's experience. Do you belong to a church family? If not, I want to invite you to join our community. We have members all around the world. Learn more by filling out our next step form or email online at visitoasis.org. Have a great week.